Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. I'm R.S. Benedict, the most dangerous woman in speculative fiction. In this episode, we're talking about what it really means to be a writer. With me today is Carmilla Mary Morell, a sorted writer of nonfiction, aspiring writer of fiction, thank you, Harley, and self-described monstrous transsexual. So I just want to establish, uh, thank you for coming on, and I want to establish to all listeners that you are not a best-selling, ultra-prolific, award-winning novelist. Yes, that is correct. I'm 26. I have five roommates. I'm a very regular person. I am not, I'm not like a best-selling, critically acclaimed author like Chuck Wendig or anything like that. (laughs) We can't Uh. all be so lucky. Oh, God. Oh, we can't all be such splendiferous fuck crustables. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, I mean, I, I would argue we are both writers because we both write and we both try to get our stuff out. That's correct. So, we're both writers. However, if you are a writer or a beginning writer or an aspiring writer and you go on social media and you try to find a community with other writers, you're going to find a lot of accounts with names like Jane Doe Writes, and the bio is going to mention something about coffee, cats, or snark, and the timeline will list hundreds of posts about writing, hashtag writing light. Most of these posts are about not wanting to write, hating writing, how miserable it is to write, how frustrating it is to write, how much you're procrastinating cleaning your house instead of writing because you don't want to write. And then they don't really write much? Like, they don't seem to actually write stories or nonfiction or anything? They do write a lot of tweets. They write a lot of tweets about writing, but they don't really write, and they don't really like to write. And it's very, very strange, because I find if you're ever, like, on social media and there's an argument between someone whose username is, like, Jane Doe Writes, and she's arguing with a user whose username is something like I drink dog cum. <laughs> like, every single time, you're going to find that I drink dog cum is in the right and has a more thoughtful opinion about literature. Every single time. Every time. The doctrine of dog cum <laughs> has never, ever steered anyone wrong anywhere. Yeah, just trust dog cum. Every single time, dog cum knows. And the thing about this phenomenon, speaking as someone who's, like, seen it so pervasively in a lot of, like, ostensibly, like writing communities or when you're like someone who's like looking for writing resources like let's just say i sifted Mm -hmm. through a lot of people and personalities like this before i like found like this podcast right it's not just me like complaining very pettily about like i'm annoyed by people on the internet who complain about writing it's more so that this particular volume of this particular type of complaint this particular type of complete like miserable aversion to the act of writing which you have so ostensibly committed yourself to if you're someone who actually does want to write and want to be a writer i think this is just a really weird tone to set it's very i don't want to say discouraging but it really yeah like i i don't if i want to be a writer i don't want to hang out with these people right i think there's a difference between camaraderie and commiserating and this (laughs) yeah like There are some days when I just have a bad writing day. Someday when I'll like try to write for hours and get like 10 words out. Or, you know, some I I won't write every single day. I know you're supposed to write every single day. I I don't. It doesn't happen every day. (laughs) And sometimes you're having trouble on a project or a project doesn't work out. But like, generally, I actually really like writing. I mean, it's, yeah, I I enjoy it. I wouldn't do it if I didn't like it because the pay ain't great. It's really not about the pay at all especially it's not even necessarily 
it's not even necessarily about like the audience or like the uh, the the non-monetary value of writing because if you're writing exclusively for money or just writing exclusively so yeah. people <laughs> can see your thing again i feel like if you want to be a writer as in not like if you want to be a writer do this i mean if you ontologically want to be a writer you should enjoy the act of writing for writing's sake and it's alarming how controversial this uh, idea is that you have to like writing in order to be a writer yeah when you when you bring up this idea like are you sure you want to be a writer because you don't even seem to like writing people get real mad and call you like a snob or an elitist or a gatekeeper it's like but i mean this is a really basic standard to be a writer you have to write yeah that's what the word means you gotta you gotta write and like make some attempt to get your words seen i i feel like it's kind of I feel like there's a line there because there's a difference between like writing in your diary that you don't show anyone versus Mm -hmm. I kind of think like seeking an audience is part of what makes you a writer. But the number one thing is you got to write. Right. (laughs) And uh, you mentioned this thing about like this kind of boring, boring of lines and this idea of like seeking an audience necessarily, like even just joking about like Sarah writes or Jane Doe writes versus dog come this idea of, well, she writes a lot of tweets. Yes objectively a a tweet is something that is written the same way that a grocery list is something that is written but when we talk about wanting to be like a writer it's this idea of you want to probably either tell stories if you're a fiction writer or make some kind of argument or revelation if you're a non-fiction writer it's hard exactly to pin down I feel like it's definitely something that you can just feel or know or point out when someone is writing for the passion of writing and writing because like they're just firing off thoughts or doing a task. And it's an important distinction to make. Right. And my cat has decided to attack his food bowl um, across the floor. So that's what that background noise is. He's very frisky today. Harley, you are, you are a monster. I, uh, He's such a good cat. But yeah, what you see over and over again is people who want to be a writer, but they don't actually want to write or read. They don't. And it's odd. (laughs) I was just going to say, one of the first things I did when I decided, like, I want to write fiction now, uh, and I should probably explain, last year I graduated from graduate school, and I wrote, like, my graduate thesis. Basically, all of my writing that I've done so far in my life has been exclusively nonfiction. And after I graduated... After, like, just working on this big, massive project for a year, I just stopped writing because I I tired of the written word and wanted to pursue other interests and hobbies. But I've come back to writing and express, and I want to, like, write fiction and have been working on writing fiction because I just missed the act of writing because it is something I enjoy. And the first thing I decided when I'm like, oh, I want to start writing fiction i didn't start by writing i started by reading i started pulling off all these books off my shelf i like bought in college and said like i'll read these when i graduate and i was like i've graduated so i'm reading them now and it's like you talked about this on another earlier episode i believe about writing the invisible that people take a lot of influence from video games and from movies and stuff and i just think that has a lot of overlap with this particular attitude of writer it's writing as an identity and not as a vocation or a practice Absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but let's, uh, I'm trying to figure out, first of all, what is so attractive about the idea of writer, capital W, as an identity? Because, like, I think we're both one of them, and it's not terribly glamorous. Mm-hmm. Um, like, I've mentioned the pay is dog shit, if there is any pay, <laughs> and... I, I guess there's this idea that you get you will be seen and heard and validated. Not that much. When I meet people, I might mention like, oh, yeah, I'm a writer. And they go, oh, okay, cool. And that's about it. Or I'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm published in such and such. And they're like, oh, that's cool. I, I haven't read that. <laughs> like, And that's, that is it. That is the end of that conversation. And that is as far as that external validation goes. It's like they, they have this fantasy. They have this fantasy that you'll introduce yourself at a party and be like, oh, yes, I'm a writer. And the person will respond very interested. It'll be like, oh, you're a writer? Tell me, what Ooh. do you write? And then you get to just talk about your ideas and stories forever as if that ever happens with that genuine level of enthusiasm with a complete stranger. Right, right. There are far cooler professions to aspire to Absolutely. if that's the kind of impact you want on the world, to be the coolest guy at a party. 
Right. If you if you are trying to like impress people at a party, you're probably better off just working out a whole lot and getting real swole. Because people will notice that instead of like, oh, I'm a writer, you just flex. And people will be like, holy shit, you're jacked. And then you tell them how, what your workout routine is. And they look at you and how awesome you are. And that's about it. If, if all you're looking for is the validation and to be seen, like going to the gym is probably better than uh, <laughs> than writing. Writing is solitary and time consuming. And, and, and there are very few hot writers. There are very, very few writers. You, you don't get hotter by writing, at least not in a physical conventional sense. I am sorry. It's like maybe <laughs> like maybe you can get a photographer, usually just like a friend of yours with a camera to take like a really flattering author photo. But like yep. you can just hire any friend or any photographer to take a nice picture of you whenever. Yeah. Or you can just be like Shel Silverstein and take the most frightening <laughs> author <laughs> photos imaginable. The most terrifying, demonic, like creepy photos and just slap him on the back of a children's book and terrify generations of children. <laughs> Fucking king shit, honestly. <laughs> like, like this I cannot looks like tell an you. angry goblin. It's so good. I cannot tell you like a single other author portrait like that sticks out in my mind. Like, I know what Stephen King looks like. I can't tell you a single thing about like, any picture I've seen of him. But Shel Silverstein, he looks like if the word breaking and entering was a person. <laughs> There's a whole section in Diary of a Wimpy Kid where he's talking about how the, he was terrified of Shel Silverstein as a child and his parents would like threaten him mm -hmm. if he misbehaved. He'd be like, hey, if you leave your room late at night, Shel Silverstein's going to get you in the hall. God, like, <laughs> so, honestly, like, that is the most represented I've ever felt, like, in fiction. Like, I read that when I was, like, in middle school as a wimpy kid, and I was like, I'm not alone. This is a universal experience. <laughs> God. Yeah. Oh, God. Contrary-wise to, like, Shel Silverstein, I think that when people do think of writer, they think of this very particular stock, uh, stock image of writer, which is, like, this right. erudite... Basically, just like imagine like uh, Michel Foucault or something like that. Just like black mm. turtleneck, glasses, some yes. ha hands on the face. You're pinching, pinching. your chin, kind of, because you're thinking. You're thinking real hard. You're like peering out over mm. a pair of glasses. Looking mm -hmm. very thoughtful. Like the, the Ernest Hemingway <laughs> with like the glass of scotch like on the desk, big cigar puffing as you're slamming the typewriter or something. Just these very particular cool images of writer that kind of romanticize the lifestyle right there's a macho writer there's the sort of romantic gothic writer there's the, the the very smart brainy writer and like most of it is not terribly true it's really for not. the most part if you are looking to be adored and, and affirmed and validated you are better off lifting weights getting real swole and posting some hot selfies on insta or maybe or maybe you could be like a vlogger or a fucking streamer play video games and people watch you will watch you play video games if like and i'm not dragging that like that's a thing a lot of people like doing and if all you want is that sense of like i want someone to see me that's a way to do it that's fine that is fine if that's what you want to do i think that that goes into what is i think a reason why a lot of people kind of gravitate towards writing even though they really don't like writing mm -hmm. which is that the writing of prose is perceived as something that anyone can do in the sense that right. it has a very low barrier to entry in terms of the task itself. All you have to do is put, yeah, all you have to do is put words in order. Anyone right. can do that. Like if you want to be a filmmaker, you need a zillion dollars. Yeah, like you need a zillion dollars and you can write a script, but then you need a film crew. You like, usually people who write a script, they would like that script filmed in some way. If you write a play, you'd like that play performed in some way. If you want to write a comic book or a graphic novel, then either you will need to be an artist or hire an artist. But right. writing prose by yourself, this is something that technically any one person can do by and there's the sense of like anybody can do it yeah you know anyone can sit down and put words on paper i guess but like making the words good is this this hard that's that's a hard part and not everyone can do that and and that kind of 
There's also a divide too in the writing community in terms of like, are you a hobbyist or are you a professional or semi-professional? And by the, by the term professional, I mean, are you getting stuff published and making some money? I don't mean you're a full-time professional writer. That's your primary source of income because like most writers are not that. Most writers have a day job. You write a little bit on the side. Like Kafka had a day job. Pablo Neruda had a day job. Like that is, that's the norm in writing. So I'm not saying like, you're not a real writer if you need a day job. Like, no, that's bullshit. Most writers have day jobs. I have a day job. Like fucking Kafka had a day job. We're not better than Kafka. So, you know. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And (laughs) I think that when it comes to like this idea of like, who's really a writer or this idea of who really wants to be a writer, I think that there's a lot that goes into just kind of setting expectations on one's own writing commitment, if that makes sense. Like, for example, I like when I finished my thesis and just stopped writing for a while, I got really into like drawing and making Mm. comics. And this is something I really enjoy doing. I really just like the act of drawing. It gives me an excuse to work with my hands for a bit and not stare at a screen. I am a very amateur artist but I don't care particularly about getting better because the technical the technical skill of an artist takes a very very long time to improve with a very oh, yeah. very deliberate and usually very boring practice of drawing shapes and shadows I don't want to yeah. do that <laughs> but I am owning the fact that I don't want to do that and I'm not going to assert myself as the next Michelangelo for not wanting to do that. Right. And I think that the same is true for writing, where if you are just purely a hobbyist uh, and not in- necessarily intending to like write very serious, serious literature or original literature, like if you're a fanfic author, if you're just writing, just shooting it off the hip to just get words out there because you enjoy pushing buttons on a keyboard, maybe, or it's just more of a social activity with friends who are also writing mm-hmm. as a hobbyist. That is perfectly fine, and I'm glad you have a very fun and and enriching hobby. But if people want to be taken seriously as a writer, then they have to take writing seriously. And that's really where all of this comments and posting about how much writing sucks and how much you don't want to be a writer, that's where that really irks me. Right, right. And there's this idea of like, oh, gatekeeping, blah, blah, blah. Well, there is a difference between a hobbyist and a professional. I'm sorry. There's a difference between like me <laughs> sketching silly little doodles on, on my notepad during really boring office conversations versus like an actual artist. There's a difference in quality in, in just discipline and just how you approach it. And Mm-hmm. Like you go to the gym regularly, but you don't plan on being like a bodybuilder. Yeah, I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm not an athlete. I'm just someone who does a little bit of, of biking on my crappy stationary bike so that my heart doesn't totally implode during the pandemic. That's that's it. I am not an athlete. And that's fine. I don't I don't pretend to be. Yeah, it's fine. Like if I can beam any one message like to every person on the planet through the medium of this podcast, it would be that if you don't want to be a writer, or if you don't like writing, like that's fine. Or if you need to change the way you write to work for you in a way that will make you like writing, that's also fine. Just please like writing if you want to be a writer because it'll make you happier. And if you don't like writing, then stop writing because it'll make you happier. Yeah, don't if, if you don't like writing, don't try to be a writer. Try to be something else. Yeah. There's other stuff you could be. You could get really good at cooking and like have a cooking blog or something. Get one of those like, what's know, really boring fine. at a party is to be like, oh, what are your hobbies? Oh, I'm a writer. What's really cool is to pick one of those really niche hobbies. Like, oh, I'm into lock sport. I pick locks recreationally because that's really interesting. And I'd love to hear oh, more about cool. that. Be like, pick that lock. Pick that lock over there. Do it. Do it, bro. Like everyone in the party, like gathering around as you like unlock the bathroom yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the thing about writing. You can't demonstrate No, it's writing. pretty boring. If you just want... Yeah, if you want a skill that you can demonstrate, either get into, like, the visual arts or, like, music. Mm. Yeah. Or, like, acrobatics, athletic... Literally anything other than writing if you want something that you can just immediately pull out. Yeah, a friend of mine was doing that earlier on in the pandemic. She does visual arts, and she was just, like, live-streaming her, her drawing sessions, and it's, like, very soothing, a sort of Bob Ross thing going on. Like, oh, here's a, here's a woman drawing some stuff yeah. that's nice to watch it's very pleasant when i wrote my thesis i like made a joke on twitter about like live streaming the writing of my thesis on twitch and just like people in the chat like spamming pog champ as i like, use my 87th <laughs> semicolon in this chapter <laughs> yeah watching a person write is not terribly interesting unfortunately um 
But let's talk a bit about away from the fantasy of being a writer when you're this gorgeous, exciting person that mm -hmm. everyone's really interested in too. The reality of the being a writer. The reality of being a writer. And the first and biggest reality is that you have to fucking write. <laughs> That's what the word means. You have to fucking write. I hope that if you're a writer, you know what words mean. <laughs> And that's it. Posting about how much you don't want to write, it doesn't count. And, and I'm not going to be like super strict about, well, it has to be published in this way. The line between traditional publishing and online content creation is super thin right now. I think self-publishing counts. Putting stuff up on your website counts as much as making your own zine did back in the day. I mean, in the 90s, how many writers were just like making their own zines in a Xerox machine, stapling them and just chucking them around. Substack counts. Putting, putting out some really mm -hmm. fucking good medium posts counts. But... You have to write. You have to write. And it's astonishing how angry people get when you say this. Right. Because it's... I, I just cannot even imagine this mindset at all where you are someone who is not writing. And I don't mean not writing in the sense of, oh, like, my mother died tragically and I've been too heartbroken to write. Or, like, I had a chronic illness and lost my job or something. My life just went totally to shit. So cranking out my thousand words a day wasn't a huge priority if that is the kind of situation that is keeping you from writing like this is not about you and your circumstances yeah. and i think that's important yeah to if you're having like pandemic writer's block that yeah i'm not gonna that that's not about you that it's happening to a ton of people and i don't blame anyone for feeling like creatively plugged I definitely, for a couple of months, I, I was working on this one project before the pandemic started. And I was like right at this scene where the protagonist is at like a crowded party. And then the protagonist, and then the pandemic happened and we were all in isolation. And I like couldn't write this scene because it felt so like strange and alien and obscene to be writing about people together close at a party. And I just had to put it aside for like four months before I could get back to it and write it without feeling weird. But, you know, just yeah. in general, like you, you got to write and it's not snotty or elitist or gatekeeping to say like to be a writer, you must write sometimes <laughs> in some fashion. I think of this very just like this very memorable tweet from friend of the show Gretchen yeah. Falker Martin that verbatim just goes every day I write my gay little words <laughs> every day I do this you have to write your gay little words <laughs> and, that's what being a writer means <laughs> like and as and as we said you don't literally have to write every day it's the mm -hmm. ideal like it's just a good thing to strive for uh, I usually write like a couple hundred words like every other yeah. day as it stands yeah. right now just just because sometimes like i come off work and i'm very just i brain fried no thoughts head empty other times it's just because i'm working on my art or just doing other right. hobbies and activities but it is something i am intentionally keeping up regularly as regularly as i can and i think that's more the ethos of the statement yeah. because it is progress and gretchen very famous firebrand mm -hmm. on twitter when she makes these kinds of arguments that in order to be a writer, you have to write, she will very genuinely tell people that if all you can get out is like a single sentence per day, that's yeah. still writing and that still matters. Yeah, that's good enough. If all you got is 10 words, if you only got like 10 minutes to yourself to write a day, like do a haiku. I don't know. Like that's good enough. That's all you got yeah. time for. That's great. Do it. Yeah. Like if you really, really, really are time pressed to write or like just aren't able to handle a very long form writing project then yeah try poetry very sincerely try microfiction there are alternatives available because ultimately you can write anything you can write in any way that suits your yep. ability to yeah, write yeah there was oh gosh i wish i could remember her name but there was this poet who ended up releasing a book of poetry that most of the rough drafts were in tweets so they're all these super super short poems and this was like back before it was when there was half the character length there is now so but she mm -hmm. released a, a book of them, and they're really fucking good poems, from what I recall reading them. They're just written in, like, these super short little bunches of words, and it's great. Is microfiction on Twitter still, like, a big thing? Because I swear in, like, the early mid-2010s, like, there were so many microfiction accounts, and some of them were pretty impressive in terms of, like, what they could put out. And again, this 
140 character limit era yeah. of Twitter. Um, but it's just not something I really see a lot of I, yeah, anymore. Yeah, I don't see many of those. I know that there's still like a micro sci-fi fantasy one that still I still sometimes see tweets from them, um, from super short ones. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's as big as it was. Uh, for all this talk, though, about like how there's so many different ways to write, there's so many ways to approach writing in a way that suits your life circumstances and what you want to write. You do still have to write, though. Like that is the yep. thing. You got to write. And I mean, that's really the main thing of being a writer is you have to write. I've heard people say, oh, I don't need to write. I'm a writer in my soul. Like, no, you have to write <laughs> on the page. I'm more of an <laughs> idea guy. What does it mean to be in your soul, a writer in your soul if you don't write? If you, you're, you're a writer in your soul, you desperately want to write and things that will stop you from writing are, are horrible and miserable. But like, I think you <laughs> used this analogy. Like, It's like being an athlete. You know, you got to fucking do it. Like. I'm not yeah. in the NBA in my soul just because I think about playing basketball. I have I would have to pick up a basketball and dribble it and, and throw it and do the other things that you do with a basketball. I am not athletic or fit, so I'm not really sure what else you do with it. But you got to practice it super hard. And there's there's the mix of innate talent, but just shitloads of work, even if you're super tall. Even if you're super oh, yeah. tall, you still got to like practice hours and hours and hours. You still got to do it. It's like... I wouldn't even necessarily compare it to like uh, a sport as multifaceted as basketball. I can almost think of it as just something like the pole vault where it's like you can train and you can practice and you can work out to build your body to peak athleticism. And similarly in writing, there's a lot of exercises and activities and just things you can do that are supplementary or part of the writing process. Like for example, every everything I write, I outline very, 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 right. very thoroughly. And I consider outlining to be like a very important part of my writing process, but it's not the actual act of writing. It's not the actual act of vaulting the pole if you are right. a pole vaulter. It is just all training and practice and lead up. Right. Right. But I mean, that is the biggest side of being a writer is just putting in the work, putting in the many, many, many hours it takes to get better and to improve yourself and to sort of sharpen your your eye to, to to be able to read better as well as write better you you start reading things in a little bit more depth with a little bit more of a careful eye because i mean that's how you understand written fiction and revising is so much of the writing process and if you can't read that carefully your own writing you're not going to be able to really fix what's wrong with it i mean that's one of the other skills of it is just learning how to read like a writer Mm -hmm. And this is one area where I'm like actually really glad that a lot of my background in reading and writing, just like having been like an academic for so long, comes from academic nonfiction reading and writing because it just really primed my brain to just think very intentionally about what I'm reading uh, and how to extract just what I need uh, from what I'm reading. Like, what is it doing? How is yeah. it doing this? How can I use what I'm reading, whether good or bad, to influence my own writing for the better and make it stronger and more intentional and more knowledgeable? Right. right. It, I, and I feel like that's something that a lot of the writer's identity kind of, they don't want. There, there's a real myth of creativity, and it's not just in writing, that like the the piece, whether it's a song or a painting, just sort of flows out of you smoothly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does not fucking do that <laughs> like whenever we're watching whenever we're watching a you know whenever there's a biopic of like a rock star there's always just we get the scene where they get the idea of of the song johnny cash going why well, yes i i will walk the line and then you know smash cut to he's in a recording studio finishing up the final cut of i walk the line and it's like ah that's how the song that's how a song happens we don't see the however many hours in between he was like messing with chord projection and getting the lyrics mm -hmm. right getting the meter right just just nailing it out we never really see that and i feel like that's that is how people think that creativity works you get an idea and then and then there, the book comes out of you and it's like no no you need hundreds of hours in between that of just writing this fucking book i guarantee you that like first early draft of walk the line is like oh, dog I'm shit sure it is i'm sure it's really weird and janky um, and bad but 
I walked the line. <laughs> like the original draft had like there were like trombones in it. Like it was like I walked the line. It's about citrus. It's a song about scurvy prevention. <laughs> it's like why am I writing this? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, like this idea of like this, the the ideas just flowing through you so effortlessly. This is one of just the most toxic ideas i think in any creative profession whether it's writing or art or anything because i think that the more that this idea that everything just flows from you so innately and so perfectly the more that that is just allowed to become this entrenched truth or this entrenched ideal where all of the great artists they just effortlessly produce it Mm -hmm. it just makes you feel like if you are not effortlessly producing it then you're just doing something wrong When if you are putting an effort, if it is kind of hard and difficult and challenging for you, you're actually doing it very right because it is very difficult usually. It's work. It requires effort and exertion. But that's what makes it very rewarding, uh, especially because um, like like you said, when some days when the writing is just really hard, really difficult, you can't think of anything that can be discouraging and even if there are things about writing specifically like if you just hate Mm -hmm. writing dialogue so you dread writing dialogue uh, or action scenes or anything like that it can be hard it can be very challenging and you cannot like it but so long as you feel rewarded by it coming together and by accomplishing that goal of writing this thing you've Mm -hmm. set out to write that means liking writing if that outweighs all of that effort and difficulty and so, uh, I don't want to say suffering, that seems almost too strong of a word, but all of the just challenge that you put into it, if it's rewarding enough to be worth it, then that is good and a good sign. And and I, I want to stress there's also this converse idea, this sort of equally, there's this other side to the coin, which is like that of the tormented, miserable artist who's like killing himself to make that you don't want to be one of those either. Like if it's, I hate writing, it's like wrestling a demon, like maybe don't do that then, do something else. Like Yeah, like please take care of yourself. And in a lot of those cases, that's like, that's like the... That's like you're just not feeling rewarded by writing. Like if at literally no point you're just like enjoying this. I hate this so much. I'm so angry. Like maybe put that project aside, start a new project or something, come back to it. You know, I've had to do that. I've I've had to do that. Or or just this project ain't working. Maybe it's not meant to be finished, but you can like recycle some of the stuff from it and use it in another story. And that's that's cool. Um, but it, it's usually not the dramatic thing. It's just you're slowly, methodically kind of working through it. That's it. It's not glamorous. It's not sexy. It's a lot like just going down to the word mines and mining out as many words as you can. And it's hard and kind of tedious from an objective perspective because you're just sitting there pushing buttons but you come out with some words you go back down the next day you come back out with some more words 15 tons what do you get etc yep any any vocation takes some work and and some of that is just sort of toil and if writing's not something you enjoy then that toil is going to be fucking miserable that's part of why you have to like writing because a lot of that slow methodical stuff is it's like spending quite some time thinking like which word do i use here am i going to say tall or am i going to say statuesque you know making these little choices and Unless you really love the written language, like that's going to be boring as shit and miserable for you. You've, you've got to have a passion for it or else it's just going to feel like a, a bad homework assignment. And it's like, you're a grown up. Don't give yourself homework. You don't have to do this anymore. Yeah. And again, like this idea of like so much laboring over word choice or things like that. Some people like just write like a ton of words and then like go back and edit it later. Other people, it's like usually a slower pace because it's a lot more kind of surgically precise of a process. Mm -hmm. Uh, And neither way is like better or more advanced. 
than the other. It's just basically, do you want to revise yourself more now or later? If you are trying to write one way, like perhaps consider trying the other way if it is so miserable or uninteresting to you. Absolutely. But the main thing here is that you got to put in work. You got to be willing to put in work. And if writing is not a thing you enjoy doing, then that work is going to make you miserable and maybe pick something else to do because the reward, writing is its own reward because the other rewards for writing are pretty small. Most writers don't make much money of it off of it. You don't get universal fame, prestige, or like babes for getting your work published. I mean, I've gotten a fair number of stories published. And what it is, is you get it out there and you get the acceptance and maybe you get your check and you get this brief high and then life goes back to normal. And then your contributor copy comes in and you post a photograph of it and people say like, oh, cool. (laughs) <laughs> and then your life goes back to normal and you start on the next thing. It's not like the door to my apartment flings over and a bunch of like pretty ladies with cash, you know, comes in and like puts flowers on me and tells me how cool I am. Like, that's just not what happens. <laughs> Most of the joy is in writing itself. I mean, maybe that's not what happens to you. But let me tell you, when I finished my <laughs> thesis, a bunch of hunks kick down the door and be like, hey, girl. <laughs> Yeah, they're still here. They won't move out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just putting garlands of flowers on you and like with that say like the world's best writer and they carry you on their hunky shoulders, you know. Nah, not not happening. That's not what happens. Especially not in a pandemic. Like, come on, let's be practical. Yeah, you, I mean the hunks the hunks aren't very good at social distancing. <laughs> like they're really not very good. Their him- himbos are really bad at like understanding that the mask has to cover the nose. They're really bad at it, unfortunately. <laughs> I just like to request like a gaggle of masked up vaccinated hunks. <laughs> One last, like, note on just this idea of people who feel so much misery when writing, so much dread about the act of writing, is if writing is your vocation or your hobby, like you're someone with a day job or just other sources of income to where your ability to write is not dependent on your literal actual survival you can just like you it's we've said this before in a few different verbiages but like you can just not write but i mean that in the sense and that like perhaps this hobby just isn't working out for you you gave it the old college try maybe pick up knitting or crochet perhaps just because you have a finite number of hours and days and years on this planet earth if there are other things you think you'd be happier doing you should probably do them and you can do something else in a crochet community although like heard that knitting and crochet communities can be pretty intense i don't know (laughs) (laughs) perhaps you can get really into bodybuilding and once you get strong enough you can join a gaggle of himbos to go break down the doors of people who did decide to stay writers right and then you can be like close to writing anyway by like lifting the successful writer on your giant muscular shoulders and telling them how cool they are i'm just i'm just picturing that one like cartoon that's like where do you work out the library and like that's (laughs) it that's the himbo and the writer Exactly, exactly. Perfect relationship. Oh, wonderful. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about excuses. Mm -hmm. The excuses people make to not write. Now, a lot of times when you hold anybody to the standard, the very basic, very low bar of you have to write in order to be a writer, a lot of times when you say that, people get real mad and they accuse you of gatekeeping. Ah, the dirtiest word. And then they tell you some reasons why it is impossible for them to write. Just because they're writers, it doesn't mean they can write. Where would you get the idea that a writer writes? That's, that's, what a ridiculous (laughs) idea. It's impossible for me to write because dot, dot, dot. (sighs) Like, if you own a car, and you've never stepped inside the car, turned the keys, put your foot on the pedal, backed out of your driveway, and, like, drove, but yet you call yourself a driver, why? Yeah. <laughs> How? What is your mindset here? You could be a driving enthusiast, perhaps, but driving is not a thing you have done. Right. One excuse that I've seen quite frequently is I can't write because I have a mental illness. And if you genuinely believe that having a mental illness keeps you from writing, then I have news for you about literally every writer or artist or musician who has ever lived in the history of our species. Writers are all fucking crazy. I don't think I've ever met a writer with a normal brain. (laughs) That very famously (laughs) well-adjusted... Yeah, writers aren't known for being mentally healthy. If your your claim is like, I can't possibly write because I, I have like some kind of brain problem. Like, buddy, buddy, we all got brain problems. What do you mean Edgar Allan Poe wasn't like the pinnacle of yeah. neurotypical? Yeah. 
n- neurotypicality. Fucking Philip K. Dick. Good lord. There, I don't even know what his brain did. It was extraordinary. The thing about the people who really genuinely feel like my depression or my depressive episodes are so bad to where I can't do anything, let alone write, or those with uh, ADD or ADHD that just, it's very difficult to like focus on any one thing, let alone writing and concentrating on writing for a long period of time. I do have genuine sympathy for these cases. This is something that I've struggled with myself. Oh, yeah. Again, it bears repeating that you do not need to write X words or X hours literally every single day. That is not the bar that we have set for nope. being a writer. Because I don't I don't meet that bar. I don't write every day. I don't write every single day. I do not. <laughs> like anyone who does meet that bar completely, literally every single day, like they unironically do deserve that like gaggle of hunks to like drape that garland <laughs> of flowers around them. I will pay for this to happen. <laughs> But when we talk about like mental illness as not being an excuse for not being able to write, I think that more important than just like giving them like a pat on the back to be like, you can do it, buddy. We're not telling you to pull yourself up by the bootstraps because we acknowledge that it's very difficult to write if you have been dealt a shit hand and been given brain problems. However, I am not interested at all in a literary landscape dominated entirely by people without brain problems. I do not want the realm of fiction and the realm of writing to be exclusively populated by the healthy, the comfortable, the wealthy, the well-adjusted. I do not need that to happen (sighs) because that would just result above all else in very bad writing, I'm sure. Extremely boring, probably. (laughs) But that's one I've seen a lot. Um, Another one I've seen, and we went over this earlier, was I have other Mm -hmm. commitments. I can't write because I can't find the time. I have a job. I have, you know, a kid. I have this. I have that. I I can't write because I have to post about writing. I'm busy doing (laughs) this. I'm busy posting about writing, so I can't write. Blocking off my three to five for posts. (laughs) And I admit, writing is a big time commitment. And I'm guessing most people don't manage to put in the hour every single day. And sometimes your life gets into a place where you can't write for a while. I believe Ursula Le Guin took a couple years off when she had kids because she realized she couldn't be a full-time writer and be a full-time mom and she chose to be a mom instead and yeah understandable i think that's really sensible and i think that's a a good choice for her and that's fine nothing wrong with it and sometimes you don't even need a reason you can just stop writing for a while if you don't want to if it no longer interests you or if you're just interested in doing other things yeah you're allowed to do other things like writing is just a thing that you are currently doing yeah but generally i think like if you got time to post you've got time to write if you got time to post about writing you have time to write and i guarantee you that writing is more fulfilling than posting about writing yeah and before anyone accuses us of saying some like if you've got time to lean you've got time to clean <laughs> shit we are not your managers we are two podcasters yep. we hold no power over you personally yeah i can't gatekeep you because like i don't own a gate the only gate i own is like can you be on my podcast and that is not <laughs> The Right Good Podcast has, I think, 35 subscribers on Patreon. We are not a powerful publishing juggernaut right now. I do not have immense influence in this industry here. <laughs> these, these are why your cats, like, scream so much during your podcast. They just are outraged at this gatekeeping of not letting them on. Yeah. But you need to let them speak. Yeah, when when Harley in the background yells, what he's actually saying is like, Raquel, I think you're gaslighting your listeners. Because I, a cat, also don't know what the word gaslighting means either. But I'm going to apply it to stuff where it doesn't belong. Your cat, who has received, like, 10k kudos on their Stucky fic, is very upset (laughs) with your takes on the fanfiction community. (laughs) He's very, very hurt. He's very, very offended. Oh, he's so, so mad. But yeah, generally, if you don't feel this need to write then why do you want to be a writer? Like, I feel like if you're just writing to be seen and not because you have a story that you feel you want to tell, like, is that a story anyone else needs to read? Exactly. Like, if you're writing a book because you want to be a writer and not because here's the story that I really want to get and share with the world, like, why would I want to read that story? I don't, eh, no. (laughs) And this is the one part of writing that, like, I do think is genuinely like romantic and that is kind of very captivating and compelling in an abstract sense this idea of you are writing the story 
because you need to tell this story because why else would you be writing it what other good reason would you have to put so much work and effort and time into communicating this idea or communicating this message that you have yeah like that i genuinely think is the most romantic aspect of writing but again these people who prioritize getting an audience getting a claim getting pat on the back for being a writer before they actually care for the act of writing itself that is the part that these people who are who are romanticizing the identity of being a writer that is the part they're actually missing the most romantic part right that is the best part like writing the story and seeing it take shape and when it's finally coming together and looking at it and being like yeah yeah this turned out pretty good like that rocks yeah that feels so fucking good that's the best part like some people like compare it to like having a baby like you're carrying it to term and then you release it out into the world i've always compared it more to like building a frankenstein's monster Mm. bones and then muscle on top of the bones sinew and flesh stitching it together taking form taking shape of course when my monster wakes up I love it. Right. Because I'm not a coward. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which I think is like very problematic of Victor Frankenstein. Yeah, Victor. This is very just immoral. They never tell you in the book that he's a bad person. How are we supposed to know? We have no idea. Mary Shelley. How are we supposed to know? You are canceled, Mary Shelley. Irresponsible. (laughs) But yeah, the best part of writing, uh, the best part of being a writer is writing. And if you don't like that, then I don't know why you want to be a writer. Maybe, Maybe you don't. I will say that if having ideas to tell stories through, like, yes, it's the most romantic part of writing, but also don't let that be your only part of writing because then you're just an idea guy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like... Don't be an idea guy. Yeah. If you're just an idea guy, maybe essays might be a little bit better and not necessarily fiction. Or if it's like, I'm writing this story as a political polemic. Like, yeah, my politics definitely go into the stories, but... A lot of the time I've found, I've realized while I'm writing, like, oh, the original political message I was planning is kind of going awry because I realized this character needed to be, you know, needed more breathing room to, like, be himself and be a full person. Than, and in order to do that, I had to kind of let go on being like, you will symbolize that, you know? <laughs> you, have a, you have a far more generous idea of what the idea guy is than I do because when I think of idea guy I just think of the guy who never shuts up about he's like got an idea for a story oh yeah yeah okay yeah Wait, just like point, points at forehead just like you know it's all up here one of these days right why isn't today one of these days yeah it can be any day just do it yeah we got time now that is the one thing we got if that is the only issue of one of these days we've had a lot of these days we're about to have 365 of these days in this fucking pandemic pretty soon Uh, god which i'm having a lot of unpleasant feelings about uh thinking about that it's not it's not good it's not great (laughs) jesus i know to be fair I think, personally, I think that they're, they're like, extending the lockdown and the pandemic on purpose to give everybody a chance to, like, write their own King Lear. Yeah. When the pandemic first started, they everyone was obsessed. Like, Shakespeare wrote King Lear in quarantine. Everyone can write their own King Lear. And it's like, yeah, if you're listening to this, why haven't you written King Lear yet? Yeah, go write King Lear, specifically King Lear. Th- this, this, is, this is sarcasm. My opinions on the take that everyone needs to write a King Lear in quarantine are very complicated and not the subject of this podcast. I did finish two rough drafts, one of a novella and one of a novel that I was working on for years. So that's pretty fucking cool. I feel good about that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now I'm revising them and it's like, oh my god. And the revision process is super slow and grinding, but it's like, well, yeah. at least I'm getting something out of this stupid fucking pandemic. At least <laughs> I'm trying to get something good out of it. If I get like a, a finished novel or something or a finished novella out of it, I'm going to be like, okay, that's cool. That's something good. Th- yeah. That is like the main thing that's keeping me going during this. Ugh, Because mm. I like writing because I'm a writer. Yeah, because writing's, like, really fun, I think, personally. Writing is great! Maybe other people might not think that, but, like, I think it. I like it. I have some bad days. Sometimes, I I think typically when I'm writing a rough draft, my usual average is around, like, three to four hundred words an hour. But, like, some writing sessions, I might get, like, 50 out, you know? And some writing sessions, I'll slam it and get, like, 600 out and be like, holy shit, that was amazing. But some days, you know, you just only get a little bit out, but you're always working something out in the back of your mind. And maybe next time it'll be better. Maybe next time it'll be better. Who knows? You know, shit. Yeah. Whatever. 
it's it's fine um and i think what people like about the act of writing is gonna vary a lot like for me like like i mentioned earlier like i'm a very kind of like surgical precise writer where i'm like laboring over word choice and sentence structure and sentence order so for me it's almost like writing as puzzle game Mm. where like i'll be fiddling with something and then just have that like really great aha moment where it clicks and sounds good and conveys exactly what i'm trying to convey and that shit hits good Mm -hmm. that is why i like writing yeah when you're mess when you're trying to figure out how to get this one thing across and you finally get like that one elegant sentence Mm -hmm. that like gets it all just right in a way that looks effortless though it's like oh oh yeah yes fucking nailed it those those don't happen in, um, terribly often but when they happen it's so good oh absolutely oh yeah that always feels great Ugh. but let's move on and talk a little bit about identity a lot of people get hung up on the idea of being a writer as an identity and i feel like this is part of a larger more general social issue of seeing yourself, of seeing other people as fixed identities or categories that are very rigid and very clearly defined and very neatly categorized and sort of very binary. Yes, and like, I am a trans woman, so I think I know a little bit about fixed identities and binaries. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and and I feel like that's such a common thing now. I don't know... I don't know if this was just something we've been doing forever, but the idea of identity as rigid and unchanging and eternal and clear cut, like I am a writer or I am not. Well, maybe you write for a while and then you take some years off. Like that's normal. Yeah. Are are you a writer or not? I, I don't know. Probably. Yeah. And I think this goes a lot into like part of it, at least, is this idea of, I think, like not even necessarily just like the hustle culture or like the grind culture, but just this kind of very new millennium problem where you like need to turn all of your vocations into like something monetizable or something that'll earn you that clout online to where you can't really just be a hobbyist or an amateur or just someone who does a thing. Like I mentioned with me and my very complacently amateur art, Right, like it's, It doesn't have to define you and it doesn't have to consume you. It's okay for it to just be a hat that you take on and off. Even outside of like monetization, I feel like there's this obsession with slotting everybody into inherent unchanging categories that define them. Like she is a Potterhead. He's a Hoovian. I'm an adult Hufflepuff or whatever. Like everybody's got to fucking put themselves and everybody else into a Hogwarts house. And it's like, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. We can just be people. You don't need to decide, here's what my identity is. This thing defines me in every way. And any attack on that is an attack on my identity. And I feel like, is this coming from marketing demographics or something? Or is it just people are lonely and need a sense of belonging? And this is the only way we kind of know how to do that. 100% stuff like Potterheads and Whovians a lot of these fandom identities that just define people who consume product with writing it's not as obvious of like a corporate kind of right commercialized identity because it's like it's writing it's something that you are creating what's corporate about it but i find it very 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 similar in certain circles to the identity of the gamer yeah because you can say you play video games you know you're a gamer that's fine right but if i tell you that i saw some posts by some gamers online you are conjuring in your mind right now a very particular kind of person with very particular kinds of associations and ideologies, a certain air about them. Right. You imagine the glowing computer, the gamer chair, and the graphic tee. The Mountain Dew. Meanwhile, when I say, yeah, Mountain Dew and Doritos, right. Xbox and Halo and right. Doritos, but... Like, it's very stereotypical. It's very, very much a stereotype. And I think my own mental stereotype I'm operating on is, like, seven years old at this point. Yeah. (laughs) But there's a very similar effect with writers, where when I say I saw some posts by writers online, you are conjuring a very particular kind of person in your head. Mm -hmm. And this kind of person has probably commercialized the writing identity through buying, like, a ton of books, always taking pictures of books, buying lots of coffee that they call writer juice and, like, mugs (laughs) that say, like, am writing or something. 
they like bought Scrivener. I say as someone who like bought Scrivener because <laughs> I liked it. But there is a lot about the writing identity that is very commercialized and commercializable. Yeah. And panderable too. And that is how a lot of it can become kind of congealed. That's how it can become kind of a cohesive identity relative to commercialization in the same way that Whovians, Potterheads, etc. are. Yeah. And there's a lot of overlap with that, of course, because if you're like a Potterhead, like that's a book that was written. You probably also want to be a writer now. So there's a very big pipeline or overlapping Venn diagram for that. Right. I mean, it's marketing demographic. There are a lot of products and services marketed to writers or aspiring writers. and mm -hmm. It is kind of extraordinary how many people are out there kind of lurking, like waiting to pounce on some hopeful, starry-eyed, aspiring writer to make money off of them. And it's so strange, too, because it's like, are, are writers all rich? You, I, it's not that lucrative a field. I don't know. Like, yeah. there's a lot of scam artists. We did have a, an episode about writing scams earlier which was mm -hmm. pretty fun. But man, there's so many services that want to like take money out of you. And ugh, it, it, it's gross. And not even services, just like goods. Like how many, yeah. how many like notebooks and journals go purchased each year that never get a single word written in them, but they sure look nice in your drawer, I'm sure. Novelty coffee mugs, special pens, novelty coffee mugs, t-shirts about writing, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh. Yeah, and I feel even beyond marketing demographics, this kind of extends into the world when we're talking about like identities, when we're talking about personal identities, access of identities, and something I found it happening more and more, especially in certain writing communities, is this kind of mindset kind of sinks into the way we talk about morality. Like, this is a good person, and that is a bad person, that is an abuser, that is a predator, and we start dividing the world into villains and victims, and this is a horrible way to look at the world with horrible consequences. I think we've seen it in, well, in a lot of these sort of writing community controversies and dogpiles, we kind of see, I think, a lot of mm -hmm. symptoms of this mindset. You're either like a good person or a victim, and whatever you do is good and just, and whatever you do can be forgiven, and if you're a victim, then and anything you do is justifiable, no matter how vicious it is. And if anybody hurts you or anything upsets you, that person is an abuser. And that person is like fair game. And you're speaking now on this, like from a bit of personal experience, because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have been very busy writing tweets at you <laughs> for a long time now. There have been some hit pieces. Apparently there's, I, uh, someone just showed me a piece that apparently is in Teen Vogue about me. And no, they didn't reach out to me and I haven't read it yet because I do not have the energy, but no, they did not reach out to me for a comment. The Mary Sue also ran a hit piece on me. They did not reach out to me for comment, so that that's cool. Yeah, a lot of the objections I got was like, you know, fanfic gives women a voice. It's like, okay, I disagree, and you're going to write about what a bitch I am without asking me for comment. Like, what about my voice? Is that not? Mm -hmm. No, okay. I guess my voice isn't good. I'm, I'm I'm also a woman, but no. But I, I I was thinking in terms of like Isabel Fall. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I know I keep going back to that, but I feel like that is like the or example of what the fuck you know. Here's everything that's wrong with like online writing communities. Where what had happened is Isabel Fall. She wrote this story, and the title hurt some people's feelings. And I do genuinely believe that some people read that title and it really upset them. And I do genuinely believe that many of the people who are upset have been victimized by queer phobia. I have no doubt that that's the case. But when you define yourself purely as a victim, what you do is you. You say, Isabel Fall's story hurt me because I am a victim and she hurt me. Therefore, she is a villain. She is an abuser, abuser with a capital A. Mm -hmm. And anything I do to her is okay because I'm a victim, which means I can't be a villain. I can't be an abuser. And anything they do is bad because they, she is an abuser and she is a harmful person and she is fair game for any level of cruelty and that's all right and and i've seen this over and over again i've seen it also for, directed at george R. R. martin like george R. R. martin is kind of for some reason a lot of people are real mad at him i think a lot of it is just that like he he's he ha, he's the big fantasy author who got real big and people probably resent that like why did he get big instead of me his books have rape in them and stuff Oh no. Yeah, which I understand like I don't I don't care for his books personally, but I don't think he's an immoral person for writing them. 
And I've seen him, him become the target of like, he is a villain. So anything he does is like signs of further villainy mm -hmm. and anything, any attack on him is okay. Like I saw, I think some editors of a, of a, of a prominent, like a, a sci-fi magazine, just basically mocking him because he said that he was having trouble writing in the year 2020. It's like, yeah, a lot of people are. And also a friend of his died at the beginning of the year, like a good friend of his died. So like anyone would get writer's block under that circumstances. But he's a baddie for whatever reason. So it's okay to be like vicious to him and that leaves such a bad taste in my mouth. Like, there's this huge swath of just, like, hate for George R. R. Martin that's, like... Yeah. It's literally just, it's literally just bitch-eating crackers syndrome where... Yeah. Just every little thing he does, like, George, George R. R. Martin would be, like, sitting at a table eating crackers, and these people would be like, look at this bitch eating crackers. Like, it's obsessive, yet inane. I brought up earlier the similarities between like the commercialized identities of the gamer and the writer, but this exact point is so apropos because when I say gamer, as I said, you picture a very particular kind of person who's like this Gamergate chud deep in the mentions of like a bunch of different women in games journalism, just like telling them to kill themselves. Incredibly angry at Anita Sarkeesian all the time for everything. Still mad about her. They're like playing Metal Gear Solid while like, they're playing Metal Gear Solid with one hand and typing, like, keep politics out of my video games with the other hand. Right. It's awful. We we picture this person in our heads and we're like, this is a bad person. That's that's bad. And it's a very simplified, stereotypical, not even really a person. It's more just like a description of traits that we've decided are bad as a whole. With the writer identity, writing is more of a noble pursuit, I guess. Yeah. Uh, when we think of writers as opposed to gamers, we think of a good person. And when writers think of writers, they think of a good person and therefore think of themselves as a good person because they are writers and writing is good and they're good for being writers. And it's a very weird moral projection right. uh, onto this vocation. Like on top of writing like for audience acclaim and writing for praise and or writing for money, there's I sincerely hope that people aren't writing just because they think that'll make them a good person or make them morally infallible or that it'll make them a wise authority to speak on issues of abuse like inherently right but given what's happened so much in writing communities and what's happened to writers like isabel fall which i always appreciate when you bring up because i will never stop being mad about that i'm never gonna stop being mad about that it was so disgusting i will never fucking shut up about it fucking horrible but the way these people are so goddamn fucking eager to think that they, the wise, super intelligent, erudite, good moral having writer, for them to center themselves in these fucking debates at the center of the universe will always, 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 always irk me, if not just infuriate me. And it, when you think in terms of like that, you know, I'm a good person, that's a bad person, like it, you start justifying anything. Yeah, it's a dangerous stopping point. Anything I do is good because I'm good and anything they do is bad because they're bad. And, and it also leaves out the possibility of any kind of redemption. Mm -hmm. I believe people can change. I think people, or people can change or most people aren't all good or all bad. We have like good parts of us and bad parts and sometimes we do good stuff and sometimes we do bad stuff. I am unsure if you saw, but the... The comic artist and publisher Carta Minier put out a thread a while ago on Twitter that was, in short, the most, what I consider to be the most like reasonable take possible, which is that dividing people into perfect victims and forever evil abusers is right not only just irrational but like uh, literally just socially unsustainable incredibly harmful too so we have to make room for the rehabilitation of people that that's it that's really the big point of the thread and people were coming down on her so hard accusing her of saying like what do you mean that i have to be personally responsible <sighs> for like the rehabilitation and recovering of my abuser what do you mean to insinuate that i need to go up to my abuser and open mouth kiss them right now 
all right. shake their hand and give them ten thousand dollars. This is not what Cartus said at all. But people leapt to that immediately. Right. It's such a bad faith reading because I mean, first of all, any anyone knows this. Anyone with any sense of human psychology understands that sometimes like bad or harmful behavior comes from a source of genuine pain. Sometimes it comes from trauma or like a substance abuse problem. And when you can deal with that, when you can deal with the root of that, the person can stop doing that. And that's good. That's good. That's much better. It's great when people stop doing bad things. Anybody knows that sometimes victims of abuse carry that on to some and do it to somebody else. Not everybody, but you know, if you are a victim of something terrible that can traumatize you and as a result you might do some shitty things. It, it, the idea that you need to have a perfect victim, it also means that like if somebody attacks someone who's not perfect, then it's like, well, it's the classic like, oh, she deserved to be raped. She was a slut. Mm -hmm. She wasn't this perfect virginal nun. So it's okay. She had a she had a spotty past. So therefore it wasn't rape. Like it's that same fucking bullshit. And yeah. Ugh. And the idea it's not it, like, what do you do? What happens? someone is bad to you, do they have to disappear forever? Do, are we going to like execute everybody who hurts somebody else? Like we can't do that. We, we just cannot do that as a society. So like we need to deal with this fact that the majority of people who are going to hurt you in some way or another, maybe it's vicious abuse or maybe it's just being a garden variety asshole, they're going to keep living in the world and we need some kind of way to like deal with this fact and hopefully maybe make it better somehow. What else are you going to fucking do? It's not so much that like this debacle, this conundrum is so inherently wrapped up in like whether one wants to be a writer or not, but it's more so that there's this trend of people either staking their morality or staking their authority to speak on morality in their identity as a writer. And you see this in the ways that people will argue that written stories need to convey certain morals, need to be didactic, need to teach you good behavior. And that is a very frequent subject on the show, so we needn't go into too much repetitive detail here. Right. But these things are connected. There's a very just this idea of putting yourself at the center of the moral debate through your identity of being a writer. And if that is what you're doing as a writer, if you think that that is what being a writer is about, first and foremost, of being a moral authority, this guardian of what is truly right and wrong, and conveying that truth through your stories, that I think is not only a very bad reason to want to be a writer, I think it's a very selfish and dangerous reason to be a writer. And we're seeing the consequences of that reason to be a writer, whether intentional or not, play out in the things like what happened to Isabel Fall and what happens to people who write, uh, as they say, messy queer fiction and so forth. And it's a really ridiculous idea too, because when you look at the history of like some of our greatest writers and artists, like most of them were fucking disasters. Like was Hemingway a paragon of vir of moral virtue? Was fucking William S. Burroughs? No, Jesus, good lord, no. Like most writers through history were were pretty fucking weird and morally uh, questionable at best. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe married his cousin that's ew dude and i think she was like super young at the time it was really gross <laughs> people in the 1800s just like loved marrying their younger cousins yeah it was real gross it was a, it, it was all the rage it was a it was a century of perfs it really was man it was just the century of creepy uncles it was nasty <laughs> i'm glad that shit's done your, your husband uncle the 19th century was like the worst century i feel like almost well in some ways i don't know it was just super gross it was a bad time yeah it was not great but ugh <laughs> yeah, yeah, just seeing these categories, these discrete categories of I am a writer in my soul, it is in my DNA, I am a good person, it's in my DNA, I am a victim, it is in my DNA, unchanging, is just kind of contrary to, to human experience and kind of leads you to think and act in ways that are real shitty. So let go. Let go of the idea of writing as an identity and think of it more of here's a thing that I do because I have a passion for it. Yes, and it's not even this idea of like you are guaranteed to do something wrong or bad if you hold this mindset. It's more just like I think that holding this mindset is doing yourself a disservice because if you accept the idea that you are a changing dynamic person who's not inherently bound to one particular identity or one particular thing or one particular activity that you've kind of pinned your whole thing on, like it's only going to almost feel liberating in a sense to be able to define yourself in other or more multifaceted ways and if after that kind of 
reevaluation of yourself. If you still want to be a writer, if you still choose to write, I think it's only going to make you a better and happier writer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a good way to end it. That is a perfect note that sums it all up. Uh, but before we go, where can our listeners find you and support your work? That's a great question. I am on Twitter at Dracula Voice. I am known as the Trans Feminine Frankenstein. If you've seen my like very good posts around, <laughs> because I write so many posts. Uh, I also have my own personal website, DraculaVoice.com. You can also go to BadTransRepresentation.com. <laughs> I bought that URL this week. So worth it's it. It's so good. I cannot believe it wasn't taken. And now it's me. Oh, I'm so excited. That's such a good URL. I'm just like, like, Twitter is just where I go to like shoot out like every single thought that enters my head the moment it does enter my head. <laughs> uh, my personal website is infrequently updated, but it's where you can find all of the nonfiction I've wrote. It's also where you can find my thesis, which I've mentioned a lot of times throughout this podcast, which is about my theory of monstrous transsexuality and how it is represented in Frankenstein films and narratives of the post-war era. Ooh. The rave reviews are in. People really like it, I think. I'm sure. Yeah, that sounds interesting. And then, of course, uh, I am an aspiring fiction writer. I've been writing fiction, and as soon as that's like done and good, that will be on my website as well. Mm. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. I know that we're like, what are we just recording it right now live? But it almost feels weird to not hear like the closing theme music like creeping in or fading in at this exact moment. <laughs> And that'll and hearing that will be even weirder for our listeners because we will put the theme in. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna be like, wait a second, where is it? <laughs> what it what it is a theme, but we're hearing it right now. What? <laughs> but thanks again for coming on, and thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks. And thank you, audience, for listening. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, head on over to patreon.com slash writegood and subscribe. Subscribers get bonus content and access to the Kitty Sneezes Discord, where we talk about writing and critique each other's work. We've got sort of a writing circle going up there, and it's it's been really good. We've gotten some really good feedback. And be sure to join us next time when we talk about the new gatekeepers. Until then, keep writing good. This has been Write Good with R.S. Benedict. Hosted by R.S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. Edited by Sid Oosley. Theme song by Surgery Head. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittysneezes.com. That is R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittysneezes.com. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash writegood. KittySneezes.com In color. <laughs> <laughs>